It, it has been pointed out to me that I, I failed in my task as a moderator before in that I did not identify the panelists to you. Uh, as it turns out, I, I know this young lady extremely well. Uh, she once worked uh, for Nightline, I say for three and a half weeks, she claims it was longer than that. <laughs> But, but it was only about three and a half weeks before she decided that Nightline wasn't nearly enough of a challenge for her, and off she went to something. And she is now the special advisor for global affairs for the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. I should really be nice to you, shouldn't I? <laughs> Mika Salmi is the president of Global Digital Media of MTV Networks. She skipped. Have I got a back? Oh, I've got a background. I beg your pardon. We even met, and you were kind enough to introduce yourself. Yeah, um, I look like Mika, though. <laughs> yeah, you're, Mika. You're, you're just as handsome as he is. Forgive me. You're Edward Burgading, Chief Executive Officer of Abu Dhabi Media Company. Uh, Carol, you're kind enough to be in the middle, so no matter which way I go, uh, I'm going to get you right. Carol Giacomo is an editorial board member of the New York Times. Uh, and uh, now we come to Mika Salmi, the president of uh, Global Digital Media of MTV Network. And that would be it. Th no. And one more. <laughs> Turn the page, and there is Sydney Suisa, executive vice president of content, National Geographic Channels International. Um, let me, may, uh, if I may, take the prerogative of. Uh, of being the moderator here by giving you just a little bit of background that just coincidentally happens to, to coincide with my own uh, lifetime in this industry. When I began at ABC back in 1963, uh, there were three television networks. They were it. If you didn't appear on one of the networks, you did not make it across the nation with your message, no matter what you were saying. <coughs> Um, over the course of the years, the technology quite obviously has changed, but because the technology has changed, because of the fragmentation that has taken place, there has also been an enormous change in the business model. Uh, and that too has had a huge impact on what everybody here and what all of us in the industry do to this day. And I'm going to make it a, a very condensed uh, recounting in the sense that from 1968 on, when CBS introduced a new program called 60 Minutes, uh, within a couple of years after the introduction of that program, 60 Minutes did something that no television news program had ever done before. It made a profit. Uh, and because it made a profit, the heads of the other networks said uh, to their news divisions, you can do that too. It suddenly became an expectation. With the diversification of media, going from the original three to what are now, whatever you want to say, 30, 300, 3,000, uh, 3 million or 300 million if you include the different people on the internet, you have a totally different model. The level of competition is different. In my industry, for example, in, in television network news, what has happened uh, over the past 10 years in particular is that because the competition has increased, because the pie as a whole has remained essentially the same, but everyone's slice of the pie is a little bit smaller, we have had to do things that we have never done in the past. And I suspect that that is also true of newspapers and magazines. What we have had to do is, for example, cut back on our foreign news coverage. I remember a number of years ago having one of the accountants at ABC come to me and say, Ted, how many times a year do you at Nightline use the Moscow Bureau? I forget what the answer was, let's say 10. They went to my late friend and colleague Peter Jennings and said, how often do you use it on World News Tonight? 20. Good Morning America, 2020, all of the various ABC programs. And then they did the calculus and they said, for the sake of argument, 50 appearances across all the different ABC platforms. It costs $2 million a year to run the ABC Bureau in Moscow. Hey, that's $40,000 per piece. 
too expensive. And the Moscow Bureau ultimately went away. Most of the networks these days do not have bureaus overseas anymore. They'll have one in London. They may still have a presence somewhere in the Middle East. Possibly they still have a presence in Iraq, although that is becoming rarer and rarer. What has happened to our industry over the years is that the economic models have driven us into cost cutting and one other thing, and then I'll turn to our panel. It has also forced the television networks in particular to move in the direction of an audience that derives for them the largest commercial sales model. If I tell you that nobody in commercial television these days cares about anyone over the age of 50, the reason that is so is because on Madison Avenue, when you buy a commercial on a program that is seen by people between the age of 18 and 30, you will have to pay up to five times as much as for a program that is seen only by people over the age of 50. Therefore, we've had these two forces coming together. The force of fragmentation, high costs, lower earnings, and the force of to the degree that they can earn more, they earn more by putting on programs that are going to draw younger audiences. And the perception of most people in broadcasting these days is that by and large things like foreign policy and the economy and health care they don't really have a whole lot of appeal. The evening news broadcasts are still somewhat of an exception to that, but if you watch television news magazines, if you watch the cable networks, you will find that if there is a missing blonde somewhere in the Caribbean, you will have a disproportionate amount of coverage <coughs> on that to the kinds of foreign policy stories that might be far more important to us in these very dangerous times. So, with that as, as background, why don't we begin at that end and come down the line and you take that anywhere you want to go. I was expecting to go last. <laughs> uh, I just, one quick comment from the panel before, and uh, I think the danger with public diplomacy is that too often, it smacks to me of marketing, and it shouldn't be marketing. So, I'll move on. I think one of the most astounding things for me, I've, I've lived in, in the United States now for five years. I think one of the most astounding things for me is that for a country that is so wealthy, so intelligent, so powerful, it has such a weakly funded, almost non-existent, uh, public television system. I think that is one of the strongest voices that you can have in the world of television, is public television. Somebody had mentioned the BBC earlier this morning. But most Western countries have very well funded public television services. <coughs> and for them, just getting back to your point, the notion of news and current affairs is seen as a public good. And if you have a public broadcasting system that is really well funded, then you have a countervailing power. You have a countervailing effect between the public system and how it disseminates news and the private system. May I ask who pays for that public system in, in most instances? Uh, the how public in various ways. Uh, in the UK, it's through a tax on television. Uh, but ultimately, it's the public that pays for the public broadcasting system. Uh, that's the only way to sustain it. Voluntarily, or as you, as you say? Mm. You I don't know, know if anybody example. who voluntarily wants to pay for anything. Well, for, uh, I mean, PBS, for example, no. is a very good example uh, where a, a great deal of the funding is voluntary. They but have, it's, it, it's too small, Ted. It's too minuscule. Uh, and it doesn't engender a real network. Uh, it's locally raised money. Uh, you need a true network, the clout of a network, to do the kind of work that a BBC does or a CBC or 
many of the public television channels that are out there. Well, part of my role here is to be argumentative. I'm going to tell you, uh, I, would, I would say that Frontline, hmm? every year, probably does more good documentaries than the entire BBC put together. Oh. I don't disagree with you. You, you need yeah. more front lines. You only have one front line. It's not enough. Okay. Please. Uh, so I, I disagree somewhat because I think you're right. It is there is a uh, fragmentation going on, and the big question is uh, in a fragmented media world, uh, uh, which I think the internet is the biggest part of that 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 trend line. The big question is uh, how do the important stories uh, rise up? And I think the why it's so difficult, and this is what we struggle with as a company, is that consumers have taken control of their media experience. They're the ones in control. They may they want to see that blonde in the Bahamas. Uh, and uh, the reality is that there are very important stories out there that need to be highlighted. And that's where I understand that, you know, the idea of public television, they, should, they, would, they would highlight it, but will people actually watch it or care in, in a world where they have control and they have uh, a choice? And, uh, and this affects us as uh, MTV networks, even though we don't do a lot of news unless you count uh, Jon Stewart as news. Um, you know, we, uh, we have, uh, we live in a world very much where our audience, our main audience is uh, our heavy, uh, new media users, whether it be mobile phones or uh, internet, and um, they don't want necessarily us to tell them what to watch, when to watch it, or even, you know, uh, how, uh, um, you know, what they should think about it. They, they want to give their opinion, they want to post their own stuff, they want to be actively engaged, so we have to let go in uh, this world. Why? And because that's what they expect and they want. If, if we try to control the message or what we try to do, uh, we lose it. What about guidance? There's too many choices. I'll go, they'll go look somewhere else. If, if we, if we want to still communicate with that audience, we need to actually come down to their level as opposed to broadcast down to them. So the, the suggestion is that if we, if we simply had a public broadcasting system that was appropriately financed by maybe the government, and we have to hope then that the government isn't going to want to become involved in what goes on the air. But if we had it out there, that people would watch it, but you're telling me, no, they wouldn't watch it, they'd go somewhere else. Right. So I'm not saying, like Andrew said, that uh, television is dead, uh, but it is uh, going to be changing to something very different where the screen in your living room is going to be a multifunction device and you'll be able to get choice wherever you want to get it. So. I think the challenge is that there are, you know, in the world of citizen media and, uh, uh, you know, there's in, in, in internet fragmentation, there's fantastic stories. There's, there's incredible reporting, some of it accurate, some of it not accurate, but how does it rise above? And I think we're just early days into this, uh, this, this new uh, medium, so it's, it's, it's a longer process. Uh, Maybe we need to find our 60 minutes, what's going to make the money. We need to find you know, what, what's going to bring it all together. I'm not sure we will, but I do think that it was, it's very early days. And fragmentation is here to stay. And, and the question is how you then harness that fragmentation in a way to actually elevate the stories that we all would agree probably need to be paid attention to. Carol, if there is a national standard for excellence in journalism, uh, it, is, it is widely conceded to be the New York Times. Uh, and yet I hear that uh, my friends at the New York Times are running into trouble. You've got your own financial problems. You're not going to be able to keep on spending the way you did in the past, even though you have an enormously supportive and wealthy family underwriting the newspaper. Uh, so where, where, where is the New York Times going to be 10 years from now? God, if I knew that, I'd really be very wealthy and be in great demand for other things than I actually do for, for work. Um, I really don't know where it's going to be. I believe, uh, I, I certainly believe that the Sulzberger family is absolutely committed to the paper and, I mean, um, and is behind it uh, entirely. Um, uh, Arthur Sulzberger, when he gave his State of the Times address, um, I, I think it was in August. Can you pull that mic a little closer sure. to you? It was before the uh, financial um, crisis really hit and he, he speaks annually to the, to the employees at the paper and he couldn't have been any 
firmer in his commitment to the excellence of the Times, the longevity of the Times, and the importance of the Times as a, a critical institution in a free democracy, which happens to really be where my heart is. Um, and when you talk about the um, uh, let me finish this other thought. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, we remain committed to coverage of foreign policy. I uh, don't, I'm not a news reporter myself. I write editorials. The news site is quite different. But I did uh, have a conversation with the foreign editor who assures me that there has been no significant reduction in our foreign coverage. There have been tweaks along the way. We no longer have a full-time bureau in Canada. We are sharing a correspondent in Eastern Europe with the uh, International Herald Tribune, which is owned by the New York Times. Um, our Baghdad Bureau is, remains uh, you know, fully staffed and um, at, at quite an expense. We've added new, uh, more reporters in Afghanistan and Pakistan because that story has become more important. So you know, from my vantage point, they remain committed as an institution to this um, vital area. Um, but, you know, yes, there are financial problems, and, uh, and the paper is taking steps to deal with it. They've, d they've used some creative ways, it seems. You know, instead of having, in, uh, they've used creative devices that don't impact the news coverage. Uh, for instance, instead of having maybe four sections on any given day, they now have three sections, and there's some, you know, very significant economy and scale by not doing an extra section. Um, they've this shrunk the, the, the pages a little narrower than it was before, and apparently that has an impact as well. So, um, you know, so they're, they're actually, they're trying, obviously. They're selling ads on the Internet. We have, I, I would argue, and of course I'm biased, the best website, newspaper website in existence. And we've done a lot to try to accommodate the new media. I mean, we've got blogs for almost every section, and um, it's unbelievable how many people respond to th the postings. I, I you don't tried, know. You tried uh, a few months ago, or maybe it's even a little bit longer, uh, you tried to have some of your top columnists on the blogs and expecting bloggers to pay something extra for that. It was a, it was a huge failure. Uh, it, it was. I, I really am not competent to speak at the business side okay. of things. That's not my job. But yes, there was this, um, it <clears throat> was actually a couple of years ago, I think, that select. time yeah. select, exactly, where you, to get the premium col columnist, you had to pay a price. Yeah. And, uh, and that didn't work out. And that's a problem for newspapers, that the content is out there for free. And the bloggers who blog with great, you know, abandon about this, that, and the other thing get their information by reading the Times, by reading Reuters, by reading AP, you know, so they're, they're, they're derivative. And, um, and uh, that's a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm not beating up on you, Carol, when I say <laughs> to, to Ed now, I, I think you sort of symbolize part of the problem. I'm the same kind of problem. My attitude for many, many years was, hey, I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter. I don't worry about that economic stuff. Right. The business stuff is somebody else's problem. Right. Yeah, it is, and as long as I was able to keep it that way, things were fine, but eventually it catches up with you and bites you right where it hurts most. Um, can we afford to even think about it these days in terms of this compartmentalization? I'm in the business and you're not, or you're in the business and I'm not. Uh, well, you can't, because when the business goes out of business, you know, no one has a job. And I think that it's the sustainability of, of a media company that, that allows people to have careers as journalists or actors or directors or anything other than, well, my, my career is a waiter and occasionally I direct a movie. It's because a business can make money that turns itself over that allows people to have careers and, and you get an industry. And what's happening in the media world right now is, is fundamental because as you, and I agree with the points that you make, the, the, the business model for media companies is changing in a fundamental way. And um, the gatekeepers for advertisers and so on and so forth are, are disappearing because people can get, get access to content in other ways and generally not pay for it. 
So, um, and as this goes forward, the problem will become more pronounced. I mean, you're seeing it already um, in terms of what it's done to the music industry. You know, people uh, can download music, and so the, the overall revenue pie in music has shrunk dramatically, and it will probably continue to shrink. And I think if you look at media overall, um, generally speaking, if this is a revenue line and this is time, um, and analog businesses are up here, and analog businesses would be, you know, traditional broadcast and print and radio and things like that. Probably 95% of the revenue of global media right now is up in this quadrant here. But over time, you're going to see the revenue slowly melt. It is a melting ice cube, what's happening. I mean, the, the, I mean, if you took that same graph for the music industry, you'd see it, you know, sort of already go like this. But if you, if you aggregate it and composite it, and digital media would sit down here. So this would be 95% of global revenue, and digital media would be, let's say, 5%. And over time, what you're going to see is this curve go like this. The problem is, is that where they meet, if, if they meet down at the bottom over time, you are going to lose all that value in media industry as a whole. Uh, what media companies, I, I run a vertically integrated media. We do print and radio and television. We produce movies uh, in Hollywood. Uh, we print, we distribute. Um, so all media companies now are looking at, well, how do we, how do we have that curve meet up here and then go beyond so that the pie becomes bigger rather than meet down here and we all go out of business together. And, and that's the challenge going forward. It's, I mean, the, the, the trite sort of expression is analog, you're, tra you're trading analog dollars for digital dimes. And, and, and unfortunately, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the fact of the matter. So it is a big, big issue. It's a big, big issue for Hollywood Studios. It's, it's a big issue for you know, Disney, where I worked for 20 years. It's a big issue for Warner Brothers. It's a big issue for all the companies. How do we change the business model? Because the business model is changing because you know, kids go online, they steal movies, they steal music. Uh, the, the print industry is really needs to go to a completely different model. We see, you know, newspapers in the United States going out of business, you know, all over the place. And its impact on how content is created and how content is distributed to people it, you know, is, is sort of a, maybe an unintended consequence of the, the transformation from an analog environment where, as you say, the pie was big, pieces of the pie could be you know, monetized in, a, in an effective way and you get a lot of money and that money can be used to create content. But when you, when you get a lot of, and there are three networks, all very rich, but when you have a hundred networks and they're all not living in Beverly Hills, but they're living in lower middle class, you can't af afford to spend content on, on expensive items as you may have before because Distribution, because it is generally an exclusive activity. If I sell it to you, you you don't want you know everybody else to to be pro to be programming at the same time because you lose your exclusivity, you lose your leverage in the marketplace with your advertisers. So, me as a content producer, by definition, I'm going to get less money because you can only pay me this much. Whereas if you were rich, you could pay me a lot more. So, th so the, the the media industry is. is is going through a fundamental shift in, in its economics, in its business model, and that is a real challenge um, uh, for the media industry going forward and how content is created and what type of content it is and just how, how you monetize it. Let me put one last, last brick in the wall here. Smita, that's, that's you. you. You represent a very wealthy foundation. And clearly, a lot of people must come to you and say, we want to create quality. We want to do really important broadcasts. And we can't convince Pepsi-Cola to sponsor. And we can't, we can't, you know, the networks which used to do that kind of thing as a public service are, you know, since deregulation, they don't feel the same compulsion to be public servants. What role are you guys playing in all of this? Good question. Um, in fact, first let me start out by apologizing in advance for my voice. I just got off a 13-hour flight from Kuwait and I'm nursing a cold. So 
uh, I might go in and out a little bit. Um, as Ted has pointed out, I'm obviously the odd duck out on this panel. You know, I don't come from a media company and I'm far from in a commercial establishment. So why am I on the panel? Um, in a roundabout way, let me get to answering Ted's question. As a philanthropy, how we got here was not too many years after 9-11, as everyone else was asking the question, why do they hate us so much? Our board wanted to ask the question, why do Americans know so little about the rest of the world that we need to be asking that question? Um, so I went out and um, uh, except for my short, though not as short as Ted is saying, stint at Nightline, um, I'm not a media person. Um, that's not my background, that's not what I know. So I spent a lot of time talking to presidents of networks, folks who were in the new media environment, people producing programming like Frontline, to see what role could a philanthropy play? Because ultimately what we do is write checks. And we often write checks for precisely those, in those areas where the market has failed. Um, having said that, our pot of dollars is not limitless. So we look at where we can either leverage other resources or really be a catalyst. So that's the context in which we started thinking about the media environment. But through these discussions, there were three well, many of the things that other panelists have said, um, obviously, I discovered. Um, but three things in particular um, struck, struck us at Hewlett. One, um, as Ted has talked about, the justification for the drop in coverage of foreign news, um, of matters overseas, was really the American public is not interested in these issues, therefore we're not going to cover them. Well, there was a certain self-fulfilling prophecy aspect about that. So we think people are not interested, so we're not really going to do a good job of covering them, and lo and behold, people aren't very interested in what we're producing because it's not interesting, it doesn't give the context. So that was one thing. The second thing, and this came almost as much from uh, my home life, my husband's the founder of what is now the largest internet radio in the world in just a few years, precisely the dynamics that Ted was talking about. Um, we were moving from a world of broadcast into a world of unicast, that people didn't have to listen to what a radio programmer decided made sense for a radio channel, they could choose what they wanted to listen to. They could create their own music streams. They could put together in essentially their own broadcast streams. And so the entire landscape was really moving from that broadcast to the unicast with great consequences, some of which I think are positive, some of which are negative, as people like Cass Sunstein and others have wrote about, written about how do you have a democracy with a shared set of values and principles when everybody's self-selecting and watching and listening to what, what they want to. And the third thing which was interesting and, and reflected in the rise of reality TV, blogs, was this craving for authenticity. Again, I think there are positive aspects to that and negative aspects to that. What, is, what does it mean to be authentic? But nevertheless, this sense of real voices, not just from upon high, and we can sort of hypothesize many reasons for that, including sort of the drop in trust of, in traditional institutions. We've all seen the polling of, you know, the American public, it's now well below 50 percent, trust news organizations. Um, but nevertheless, this kind of craving for authentic authenticity, different kinds of voices. So that led us to, I mean, we do support some of the traditional. We support PBS. We give money to NPR to help keep some foreign bureaus open. We support programming like Frontline World. But it really led us to say, how could we operate and what could we do to catalyze um, content in this kind of a marketplace um, that I've described here. And for us, um, we decided um, and sort of threw out the idea of let's, oh, my cell phone, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, let's begin to think about programming and not just supporting the content, but rather catalyzing the networks by which that content 
will get out to a larger audience. Um, and that led us to look a lot at documentaries, which were starting to enjoy their day in the sun. Um, and also think about how we could, going back to our original purpose of Americans knowing so little about the rest of the world, how we could bring more foreign perspectives to bear on Americans' understanding of the world. And for us, that meant let's start, we didn't know how, but could we support work of more foreign filmmakers, documentarians, to tell stories from around the world, not just the context. And this came from, I remember reading a poll that Pew had done, that a lot of the reasons Americans did not go after international, or read international news or listen to it was they didn't understand the context. They had no connection to these countries or these, these people. And so we began to look at ways that we could support international filmmakers in create, in other words, seed the marketplace, though, was, though it was a supply side initiative to seed that demand to bring those pieces back to the United States, which led us, I mean, I don't know how to evaluate documentaries or to, you know, reach out to filmmakers, which led us to ITVS and forming a partnership with them, which, you know, uh, you'll hear more about later, but has resulted in a very short period of time in completely, I, I don't know what the figures are right now, but literally tripling or maybe even quadrupling the number of foreign documentaries that are making their way onto U.S. channels, and here I include multiple kinds of channels, both broadcast as well as online, um, with HBO, Sundance, IFC. Some 80 documentaries thus far have been funded coming from 62 different countries. And here's the key. The cost for us compared to outright supporting, you know, I remember one network president telling me, well, what you could do is buy an hour on our network, um, compared to the cost of, say, that, has been really minuscule. And what we're doing is we're starting to, as I said, stimulate this demand that we hope um, again, it's a hope, I can't say it's happened yet, um, but that uh, media distributors and other companies will pick up. But let me stop there, that gives you Good. a second. It's, uh, let's go, let's begin the dialogue now and get some questions from you. And, and while, we're, while we're waiting for the mic to come over, let me read you one of our longest questions here. Um, from Afri Nomad, which sounds like a, an interesting choice of names from Morocco. Outside of the U.S. and Europe, does public television have a positive connotation anywhere else? Now, you were talking at the beginning about public television. Have it. I'm sorry? Does Well, I mean, if you go to Germany and watch ZDF or ARD, watch some of the BBC channels in the U.K., well, Channel 4. Other than, other than the U.K. and France, the United States. Why don't we just say, other Western than world. some of the traditional Western European style countries, anywhere in the third world, for example? No. There, there somebody had made the <coughs> distinction earlier of state-owned as opposed to government-funded. You get into the situation of state-owned, mm -hmm. and then that's a completely different. Got it. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, uh, Ted. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Innsberg. I'm president of Leilina Television, which is a content provider. You're shaking your head because Hewlett Packard is one of our benefactors. Uh, we are a not-for-profit producer of television programming that airs on Arab television stations, commercial television programming. But we're a not-for-profit. And we're a not-for-profit because in the Arab world, where there are so many stations that do not have content, they pay maybe 20 cents on the dollar for original programming. And the question to the audience, we've produced uh, several television series, as well as documentaries that have aired on Al Arabiya, and I think we're the only te television production company that's actually produced several c successful television series that have aired not only uh, in the Arab world, but also on Sundance here in the United States, enough of them like commercial. But the question is, given the fact that there's such a paucity of funding uh, for Arab commercial television stations that want content from the United States. Is there a model that anyone can come up with that would help uh, develop a more commercial, commercially viable way to produce that content and for distribution 
uh, in the Arab world that is not going to make this strictly a not-for-profit business. And, and may I add something to your question only with your permission, and, and also not be politically suspect. Right. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Any, anyone uh, take a crank at that? Please, Ed. Yeah, I, I probably should answer that one. All right. um, the, um, the, problem, the problem with media in the Arab world is that the, um, the, the systematic exploitation of content is dysfunctional. It doesn't work the way it works in, in the West. So, for instance, the, in the television environment, I think there are 163 uh, satellite television uh, broadcasters in the Middle East. Um, they're all free to air, everybody can get everything, and uh, they all lose money. Um, there should be some consolidation, but the reason that they lose money is that, the, is that there's no people meters that exist in the marketplace, so there's no currency to go to advertisers and say, okay, 10 people watched my show and you owe me money for 10 people. So what, so what, what we find is that on a per capita basis, uh, advertisers buy our airtime for about 25 cents on the dollar. So instead of it being a two and a half billion dollar TV industry in the Middle East, it's about a 600 million dollar marketplace. So what you then therefore have is an industry that is, that is starving for capital. So there's, there's not a great ability to, um, uh, to fund content. And by definition, when you, when you have a bunch of activities that are happening that don't turn a profit and aren't sustainable in an economic business, you don't actually have a business. What you have is a, is, is a vanity. And it is a vanity industry. Much of the media in the Middle East is, is vanity because there are guys willing to fund it um, just because they, they want to have it because somebody else has it, they want to have it, and there is no prospect of an economic return. Pay TV in the Middle East has, uh, has lost literally billions of dollars over the past 10, almost 15 years now, Ob Orbit, Showtime, ART, have all lost a lot of money. And they will always lose money because piracy takes all the, all the subscribers away, people just steal it. Um, and free TV suffers the same dislocation of the uh, of of economics mm -hmm. and so what you see what you see and why the print industry in the Middle East is I mean we just launched a a very expensive very very high quality English language daily newspaper to much acclaim and it really is an outstanding newspaper anybody that reads it and, and sees the national um, uh, it, it really is a superb newspaper and we have 36 foreign correspondents around the world and it, it really it really does have you know, an outstanding look and an outstanding uh, an outstanding um, editorial uh, perspective um, that I think stands up anywhere anywhere in the world um, but what you see is that is that the print industry in the Middle East is actually flush with money because the, 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 the marketing companies, the P&Gs and the Unilevers of this world, they're not spending it on TV, so they spend it in print. And so you have this sort of, this sort of inverse relationship to the rest of the world where magazines and newspapers get flooded with money and TV is poor, whereas, of course, in the rest of the world, it, it, it's the other way. Is there but, any model where the, where the Internet, uh, in other words, I realize part of the problem is somehow advertising on the internet in a way that is measurable and payable by someone. Does that work anywhere? Um, yeah, it does. And um, it, it increasingly it will become, see, w what's, what's happening is that uh, advertising, I think there were, it was explained to me, there were four ages of advertising. There was in the 20s where people said, I've got a product. And that was what advertising was meant to do. It was supposed to just inform you that you could come and I could sell you a car. And then in the 50s, it became, it became driven by uh, 50s and 60s by the creative industry. It was called Advertising 2.0. And, you know, I'll make you, really, I'll make you a really cool TV commercial. <clears throat> and that drove, I think there's Madison Avenue, what's that TV show now on HBO where they talk Mad. about? Yeah. Mad. That, yeah. that, that, and this was, this was advertising 2.0. In the 80s and 90s, it was driven by demographics. It was media planners saying, okay, I'm going to now find your audience for you because the, 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 
the commercial became less important to actually being driven by demographics. And now advertising is now in what, what, is, what is understood to be advertising 4.0, which is, which is that this concept of advertising to create an impression is now being repl replaced by CMOs who want an engagement. They're no longer happy to say, okay, I put, my, I put my show on CSI and there was like 10 million people who watched it, but I'm not sure how many people watched my commercial. And I'm not sure the people that watched my commercial were actually interested in, you know, if I'm selling beer and a bunch of, you know, seven-year-old girls were watching, you know, my commercial, I don't know how much good that did me. And so now, because you can click and, 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 and know who actually watched your commercial, what you're seeing is this shift to engagement. Uh, marketing guys want to know who watched the commercial. They want to know who that person was. It's, it was much, it's much like in the financial industry. It's sort of you need to know your, know your client. The advertising industry, the marketing of products now is very, very much driven by they need to know who you, who you connect with in your media. So, for instance, in my company, we are completely changing the way that we market our media, the language that we talk to people, and how we... Uh, collect data and then authenticate that data to people, to the people that are watching it. Let me, let me bring a few more people in here and at some point or another I think we need to sort of square the circle and come back to where we were earlier this morning. How is it that what we've been hearing about here, and let me tell you I think it is extremely important that we all become aware of the, the business model that drives the industry that will allow people to hear the message we want to convey to them. So this is not irrelevant to public diplomacy. It's absolutely at the heart of public diplomacy, but we need to sort of explain that. Uh, let's start with the lady in the back there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Charlotte Cole. I'm from Sesame Workshop and I oversee what we call our Muppet diplomacy work. <laughs> um, and I actually have a question for Mika. Am I pronouncing your name? Yep. Um, I've seen some of the work that MTV's done in HIV, in uh, education in Africa. And it, it strikes me as very interesting because it parallels some of our work that we're doing in Africa with our <coughs> HIV positive Muppet. We're working with a different age group. And I, I think there are two things. One is I'm not sure people even know about what MTV's doing in this arena. And I'm just wondering if you can tell people a little bit about it and describe, um, you know, how do you fund it, how is it received, and what do you have any evidence of its impact? Sure. So um, I think it all comes to Viacom as a corporation, as our, our diplomacy. Um, I think there's a few ways we do it. I mean, one answers your question actually about why can't you sell it to other stations is that we actually take a very local approach. So MTV Arabia is a licensed operation. Uh, owned by local people, and if you watch MTV Arabia, if you watch MTV Turkey or MTV Russia, it looks nothing like MTV in the U.S. It's all local productions, it's all local music, it's, it's very different. Uh, on the same time, we also want to feel like we're giving back to these local communities. It, it's a stated goal for the corporation, which is, I think, an interesting thing for a corporation, and I've only been in the company for a few years, but I've been impressed by it. It's, it's really a stated goal that they want to make sure that they're part of the local communities, part of the global community, and part of that is doing what we call you know, pro-social initiatives. Uh, and they are everything from, you know, I have a whole list here of the ones that are currently running, and they're everything from MTV Exit, which is a, a, a campaign in Eastern Europe and in Europe about uh, trafficking of human trafficking, to the HIV uh, um, campaign, to we have one in Darfur, we have something going on in Somalia, um, but particularly the HIV one is called Staying Alive, that one's been going on for a long time, and it's, it's in... It's, it's basically a global initiative, and we basically tell all our operations that this is our global initiative, and, and, and we give either actual money, or we give uh, PSA support, uh, or we do a lot of local events. Because we are a company, especially the MTV brand, more than maybe Nickelodeon or uh, Comedy Central is someone that is in touch with artists, what we'll do is we'll lend our name and our, and our credibility to, let's say, a concert, uh, to a fundraiser, uh, these kind of things, so that it, we, 
a lot of it is basically stuff that we can do without actually having to spend money, but it's just using our kind of market power. And that market power doesn't come just because we're MTV in the U.S., which I think has a very different reputation in the U.S. and does globally, but it's because we're on the local level already in terms of, you know, the artists we work with, the shows we produce, everything else. Um, so the impact of these so pro-social campaigns, I mean, we have lots of stats, and I actually have a few brochures, if anyone wants a brochure on what we do on the pro-social side of things. Um, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable, and uh, I think uh, um, me as a newcomer to the company, I'm pretty impressed, and, uh, and I think you're right, we don't get enough credit for a lot of that we do. I think all anyone wants to hear about is Tila Tequila and, uh, and uh, the crazy stuff they do in the U.S., but actually on a global, global scale, they're very, MTV is known as someone who really tries to help out and do these kind of things, and so I think <coughs> that's kind of our diplomacy, I guess you would say. Can, can I just add one you? thing? Um, th that is a partnership, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mika, with the Kaiser Yes, Fa foundation. Yeah, we, so there is an is interesting model where philanthropies put in a little bit of money but partner with media media That's right. companies. And can you can you just explain, Mika, where the the strategic planning of the company is there? What does it hope will emerge from this five, ten years down the road? That's a good question, I think, because it in general, uh, and I think I you know tried to explain before, <laughs> even when it comes to the internet. We want to be in touch with our audience, and I think by us doing these pro-social campaigns, we feel that we are now um, providing a service, but we're definitely in touch with who our audience is and what they care about. And in some cases, maybe they don't even know about it, like say trafficking, or even we had you know a whole thing on Darfur. We feel that by doing that, we are providing this, and that's going to give us a little more depth with our audience, and so then we can connect with them in a deeper way. So it's 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 more about us uh, trying to, I would say you know. Not, uh, we're trying to get the word control our audience, but we're to hold on to them in some ways as they start becoming into a fragmented world. So we have some kind of deeper meaning with them. What does connect with them in a deeper way mean? Um, I think as opposed to uh, it just being about you know music videos or something or, or a TV show that um, is uh, is just kind of you know is here today, gone tomorrow. It's it's we've done something that's helped their community or helped someone they might have known. A lot of people know people are HIV positive, so they feel like wow, those guys have actually done something for my friend or for me personally. Um, I, I I have a lot uh, better feeling about the company. I want to I'm gonna, I'm gonna let support. Me, let them. me let me get it right out front. I'm a cynic. I don't believe that corporations do things just to be nice guys. Yep. Somewhere down the road, your company expects, Absolutely. We want a, we want a bigger expects audience. to benefit so we, from this. We throw a concert you know, around the HIV awareness, and we'll have Bono there, and people watch the concert. We'll, we'll make money at it. Obviously, it's, ah, it's, 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 right. it's growing our audience. But I'm saying connect. That grows our audience. That holds on to our audience instead of our audience going off to a competitor or a, a website or something. And, and would anyone like to try to connect this to what we were talking about this morning? If, if a private company or a foundation can do that, is that something the U.S. government can or ought to do? Carol, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you hide behind that. I just work for the editorial department here. <laughs> well. You know, I don't think we're in the business of telling the U.S. government what to do. I mean, we have a purpose. No, we're analyzing what they do here, and we, uh, you know, I mean, you particularly. I'm just speaking from myself and my newspaper. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I'm just saying as someone who writes editorials for the New York Times, you've been known to, you know, sort of jab it every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> That's true, and we do that on the editorial page. But I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to get at. What I'm, um, trying, to, what I'm trying to get at is if corporations can establish a presence for themselves right. in the Middle East or in Africa by doing things like running a, an HIV or a type uh, HIV awareness campaign because somewhere down the road they think that's going to lead to better business for them. Right. Is that the kind of thing that the U.S. government, which really has been floundering, floundering around these last few years, uh, in, in trying to gain a better image for the United States and for U.S. foreign policy, can the U.S. government do the same thing? Well, I'm of the belief that the, the, what, the, what the United States government does uh, to, to reflect its values, the best of its values, um, is what sells America to the world. And, uh, I mean, George Bush did have a very effective HIV program in, in Africa. He, he's been wildly... Um, uh, uh, you know, praised for that. Um, but there were other policies of this administration which uh, clearly uh, seriously damaged the Amer America's image. And, uh, you know, 
President Obama seems to be moving pretty quickly to reverse some of those policies, and I can only believe that that will have an effect, you know, going forward. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I, I don't think the U.S. government um, can, they can do certain things in public diplomacy, but I think that the, th that there's a great deal of skepticism, and, and this goes back to the authenticity point. People aren't stupid. <laughs> Anytime th something smacks of having an agenda, which, you know, by its very nature, programming, you know, supported directly by the U.S. government does, I, I think that mm -hmm. undermines. But having said that, I think there are things that the government can fund at an arm's length. So, for example, you know, I was talking about our support for documentaries coming back in the U.S. as in a partnership, the U.S. Congress through the State Department is actually funding doc independent documentaries that were made in the U.S. not for the purposes of public diplomacy to actually be shown overseas. Um, and, you know, they've been shown in Indonesia, Bahrain, I think Pakistan is coming up, Peru, India, Indonesia. And by all accounts, they're very successful. I remember in, I was in Cairo uh, talking to, uh, you know, a group of young people in their 20s, and I mentioned Al Hara at the time. This is a few years ago. And they all rolled their eyes. Um, and they said, oh, we don't listen to anything. And I'm, I'm going out on a limb here. Sorry for those of you who, who either work at Al Hara or support it. Um, you know, they roll their eyes. They're like, oh, we don't watch anything on Al Hara, except the documentaries. Because, <laughs> interestingly enough, they made a distinction there. So I, I do think, in that sense, it's the arm's length that maybe the U.S. government could do, but I'm not so clear, and others may disagree with me, that they can support direct programming or content. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. L let me introduce myself. First of all, I'm uh, Golia Mary. I was the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Educational and Cultural <laughs> Affairs until two weeks ago. Uh. And uh, uh, it's part of our peaceful transition of power, <laughs> 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 which is what makes this country great. Um, I, I just wanted to um, just make a quick clarification on the question that you asked about the U.S. government working with the private sector. And I wanted to say that the video, the documentaries that you're talking about, in fact, are funded through the Bureau of Educational oh, and yes, Cultural Affairs. Oh, yes, and I think Affairs, that's great. I think that's a great. They make a tremendous yeah. difference. Yes. The U.S. government, in fact, does collaborate with the private sector, and in my opinion, it needs to um, collaborate even more. We launched a public-private partnership initiative after we saw the successful collaboration that we had with MTVU on our Fulbright scholarships for um, artistic individuals. And this is a great collaboration with MTVU where um, we work with them and with their help and the artists that they bring to the table we select uh, four Fulbright um, grantees every year that actually go around the world and do music, art, and all sorts of wonderful things together with their young counterparts. And while they're doing that, they video it, they blog about it, they do all sorts of wonderful things about it. The social networking site that uh, um, Ambassador Glassman talked about, that is the US government's first social networking site, was launched by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And a lot of the mental support from that, in fact, came from MTV. Um, one of the um, top executives at MTV came down to Washington along with four other amazing, wonderfully creative people that had established great websites themselves. And they educated us on how we can bring in the youth demographic into the social networking site. And I'm proud to say that I just heard that the number of um, participants in that site has been um, doubling, actually, every uh, couple of weeks. And there's been other collaborations with the private sector, like Adobe Youth Voices, in fact, Adobe, partnered for the global co video contest that was just launched. Um, there were announcements with Dole Foods, with Intel, with um, Freeport, and Dell in Brazil, and a number of other companies on some of the great programs that really make a difference around the world and in the meantime are a great part of U.S. public diplomacy. May I ask you a question? Can you point out any program 
that the State Department in this capacity supported, with or without um, financial help from a company, that was in any fashion critical of the United States or critical of a U.S. policy? You know, I think what Ambassador Glassman mentioned, if you go on the Exchanges Connect website, where this wonderful young lady is now the, um, the person that actually over oversees that website, there are lots of conversations that are happening on that site that are critical of U.S. policy, and then you have the community weighing in with their opinions. You know, there's people that are slamming the United States, and there are people that are defending the United States, which is exactly what um, Under Secretary Glassman said. The point, I, the, the point I was trying to get to is that in the, in the mid-late 50s, when Ed Morrow was the head of USIA, the, the ethos of U.S. public diplomacy in those days, although I don't think the term was ever used, was you tell the story of the United States what's and all. Mm -hmm. So that if you do a documentary, the documentary may be in some fashion critical of a particular government policy, but by virtue of the fact that the American government is actually putting out a critical program like this, you are exposing what is the greatest strength of America, and that is exactly. its willingness to be seen. Mm -hmm. If there is a major criticism that I would make of the Bush administration, it was that it placed a greater emphasis on ideological loyalty than it did on competence or the truth. And it is, it is in that sense that I'm posing that question to you. You know, I must say that as a first-generation immigrant myself, I know it's very difficult to know America's story and not love everything about America. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As, a, as another first-generation first immigrant, uh, I disagree with you. <laughs> um, can, Ted, can I just... Um, please. Uh, the um, just to sort of bring it back to public policy and, and media companies, I think that I think that um, you know thinking of the United States as a brand, which which I heard the first panel sort of mentioned to, I never thought of a country as a brand before, but when you do actually think of it as a brand, in terms of taking the, that brand's message into a marketplace, there are very traditional techniques for doing that, and I think that I think there is. I mean, we talk, we're talking here to some extent about above-the-line marketing, which is advertising and documentaries and those sorts of in the internet. But another critical component, I think, of any public policy that, or public di diplomacy that we would have would, would be what is known as below-the-line marketing, which is you go into the streets and you do things uh, for F FMCG companies, it's you're in the stores and your and your marketing is direct marketing to people. And I think that I'm sorry, what is FMGC? Uh, um, FMCG are FMCG. fast moving consumer goods companies. Ah, okay. So they would be the big marketing companies. So um, they they all knew that, but I didn't. Right? <laughs> all right, hands up. Who knew what that was? Um, and um, uh, I think I think that that for the United States to take this goodwill that exists at the moment, it, there, needs to be, there needs to be an integrated and sophisticated approach to the marketplace by not only pumping out uh, above the line marketing messages, but also to go into the communities and do the things that we're talking about. I think for the United States to put to, to work with corporations or media companies uh, uh, on, let's say, non-political issues, but just doing good things for people. I think that would be that would be huge, hugely accepted and and welcomed any place, any place in the world. And I mean, I don't know how you do that. The, I mean, the, I mean, the big I think the big problem in any organization, large organization, is is the transition from talking about something to actually doing something. And it's that ability to actually affect a mechanism that allows you to translate goodwill and talking into action on the street is, is, is not a gift that governments generally have. And, but it, it is a requirement for a business to have. And right. I, think that, I think if you put those two, two things together, the message can actually be transmitted even if the message is, is, is simple. I have an idea. How about the U.S. government buys Facebook? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> let, me, let me just read you a, 
what I must uh, point out is an anonymous blog. Aren't we being naive to allow ourselves to believe that the media industry is merely an industry and that it doesn't have an obligation to rise above that level? This is one way in which U.S. business is very limited in its thinking because in the U.S., media have almost always been completely private. But that's not the case historically in the rest of the world. The gentleman from NTV Network in particular is showing some lack of knowledge when he says his network must give the people what they want. His own network was one of the most important in helping to change perceptions about things like gay rights and HIV awareness in the 90s. And it happened because there were producers with NTV that wanted it to change. There's no reason why more important topics like these can't be treated in the industry. Pick up on that. Well, I, I'd, ar I'd argue that that's happening right now for National Geographic, anyways, with the environment and uh, approaches and uh, programming and initiatives that are tied to the health of the planet. I think National Geographic is a really good example of public versus uh, and private. I don't know how many people know, but National Geographic is owned by Fox, by News Corp, uh, and the society itself is a minority shareholders in the channels. But what they do control are the values of the channel, which is very important because that sets the editorial direction. So you have a private company that exploits that brand to make money, yet it <coughs> exploits it on an editorial level that the society is comfortable with. And those values have to do with exploration, <coughs> with the good of the environment, and promoting that environment. The money that is made uh, by the channel that goes back to the society then gets invested in allocation to researchers and scientists in the field all over the world, uh, sponsoring uh, what we would call emerging explorers and supporting them. So there is a possibility of making money, of being a profitable enterprise, while maintaining to certain values that you are true to and continue to be true to throughout. Um, I've been handed a very important message. I don't know if you can read it all the way in the back, but it says, lunchtime. <laughs> um, you want to just, do you want to just end on uh, one more question? And uh, go ahead, sir. Ask one more question, and let's see if we can get a very quick answer from everyone on the panel. And I really do mean very quick. I'd like to put together the morning and this panel. Please. It strikes me that what I've heard from the business model is that news is a loser. Mm -hmm. That information informing the public is basically a losing proposition economically. So is public diplomacy broadcasting or whatever, basically. It's a public function. So the real dilemma, it seems to me, we have is the same one we have in education. Public education is a loser. It is a public good that is essential. We always in this country have assumed that an informed electorate is essential to the preservation of the system, of the democratic system. Now, if the business model is not answering that any longer, where do we go, in essence, in this environment to assure that we have news coverage from abroad, to assure that we have adequate content in the, in the new media, to inform our public, and I would argue that good public diplomacy is simply good politics. That if you have good policy, it's, you'll have good politics. Let me ask you, so I, you've asked, you've posed a, a fascinating subject, and you've asked a great question. Let's start at the end, and please, 30 seconds each. Well, I, I mentioned it earlier. I think you need a strong, vibrant, dynamic, well-funded public broadcasting system. And I made a joke about uh, Facebook, but uh, the U.S. government owning Facebook. But I do think that uh, the only way that uh, the government will affect it was if they recognize that uh, the world has changed and uh, they cannot control the message. They're going to have to actually be a participant in the message via um, various media like Facebook. I mean, for newspapers, uh, there's a lot of thinking going on about what could be a new model. Um, people are talking about charging for content online, like like uh, songs are, are charged, a dollar a, a hit. Um, th there's even been talk about a nonprofit foundation or some sort of government tax breaks. I mean, it may have to get radical if people think that newspapers and a, uh, an established media such as 
I represent is worthwhile and important to a democracy, they may have to take radical steps to save it. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. It, it's, it's, it is the fundamental question. It doesn't only relate to news. It relates to other forms of content. But I don't think news is ever going to go away. And I think that, that people will find a way to, to finance it um, and, and to make it viable. I mean, free societies need free access to information. And whether that comes you know, in a formalized way through networks and, uh, and news shows, uh, it, remains to be seen but what what we do need to ensure and maintain is that the is that the authentic authenticity of the message and that the news it's not being manipulated and controlled and so that that the, that the information people do receive is, is is actually news and not being used for a different purpose um, I again don't have a good answer all I would say is some parts of it I do think there needs to be more public funding but again not directly for government produced media but for these arms length transactions that allow the atomized transactions to take place and that's really been the strength of American public diplomacy you know over time the Fulbrights the you know the the, the exchanges they're now going to take place in new new media but I do think there needs to be more public funding but again perhaps some more creative models um, like the one you mentioned where private foundations are funding one aspect and the Congress is funding the other through the State Department of public private ventures but having said this I mean it, we may have to admit that the marketplace itself may not support the, the kind of content we're talking about. And there may be a need at some point, I'm not, at some level, I'm not saying the whole bit, for either philanthropy or public funding um, to, for these kinds of uh, content on various media. Just one quick observation on uh, the public appetite for substantive news. National Public Radio, with its morning edition, with its all things considered in the evening, has gigantic audiences for both programs. I think roughly 14 million for uh, the morning program and maybe around 11 or 12 million for the evening program. Uh, NPR, nevertheless, has had to go through some draconian cuts these last few weeks. There is an appetite. There isn't enough to support it. And part of our problem, I think, is to bring those two, is to bring those two elements together and, and solve the problem. But the appetite is there, and the good product is there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll be back after lunch. <laughs>